All right, the property prequel, be in the know before you buy. Nathan Cross. Shrams, mate. Good to see you. It feels mate, like I haven't seen you in ages. It's been a minute. Yeah. It's been a minute. We've uh, both got a bit of sun. I can tell you you've got a bit of sun for sure. Where'd you get off to? Yeah, I've gone from pasty white to Yeah, no, you're looking, looking good. Looking um, good. Mate, yeah, it was good. Um, didn't have a heap of time off, but got plenty of plenty of sun and surf, which is, nice. uh, mate, if I get that, I'm, I'm pretty much a happy man. So nice. I didn't do anything extravagant, like go to the Philippines, like nah. some. But uh, <laughs> how was yeah. your trip, mate? It looked amazing. Yeah, it was unreal. Reconnected with some family and took mum over. And yeah, mate, it was unreal. Yeah. Like that, that's what it's all about. Like, um, got to smell the roses as well, right? And I tell you what, I've, I've struggled coming back into it, but I think this is going to propel me. The Every time I chat with you, I get that little bit of, motivation to come out of the sheds and rip in this year so good. i thought for the first one for the year um you know we, we were always around last year talking around and the feedback we got was all around setting yourself up for success like before you go out like what was the analogy we always love before you go out to cut have a sharp sharp saw that's one of your favorites oh, sharpen mate. the saw and today's we really want to start the year strong for all the buyers out there because the sentiment it's interesting, right? Like there was that negative sentiment all around last year. I think people are realizing now the opportunity at hand. Mm. And I realized the first week and not just for myself, but from a lot of real estate professionals, hopefully this adds some value that, mate, I was seeing double digit open home numbers yeah. for the first time in probably um, eight weeks, nine weeks. So it's been a long time. And then, yeah, it was it was really, really interesting. I'm, I'm not jumping the gun yet, but I'm just saying mm. I, I was really surprised. Double digit open home numbers for a lot of agents. And if you are looking to buy right now, just chat to an agent you know and just ask them what, what are the numbers been like and uh, you'll be very surprised. Yeah, I saw a post from one of our favourites, Josh Willett, McGrath at Palmy, and I think his first open, three open homes, 105 unique groups wow. through. So he sort of said it had a 2021 feels about it. So mm, again, interesting. too early to call that. Yeah. But um, certainly yeah, some positive keep an eye. sentiment. Yeah, and keep an eye on how that goes. And again, you'll be probably you know, no, you know, know, the best one um, around the coast to be able to judge those numbers given that you do cover a lot of different uh, territories. So keep an eye on this space. It's, it's exciting, mate. Yeah. And, and as I said, we just want to make sure everyone's prepped for a big year. So really excited. We've got um, what I deem as the, the absolute goat in, in tax accounting chat um, for property. Like yep. I love the niche here, the niche on niche that not only is he gun with tax and account, but if you're someone who's looking to either build a portfolio, scale one, or um, get into the property market, this guy walks walks a walk, talk yep. to talk, kind of thing so it'll be really interesting i've had some good questions come in as well that we're going to unpack a bit because it's one of those topics that um you'll hear different advice from all different a- accountants so i feel this one's going to be very property specific so hopefully it's going to add some value but we're really fortunate all the way from sydney mm. the western sydney what a ch- oh he'd be loving this right uh. now on the gold coast jeremy <laughs> Yenazelli. Yeah, we got that right. Oh, I had a crack. Yeah, had nice a crack. One. Yeah, yeah, that Italian. Um, Yenazelli from um, KHI Partners down in uh, Parramatta, mate, obviously. If you are in that property world, like the little, mate, you, he's like the goat. You already he, know he's, him. He's, yep. Yeah, he's, his company's um, huge down there in Sydney, but um, we're going to unpack some really, really good questions. So, mate, thanks for stopping by the Gold Coast. Mate, pleasure. It's a, the weather's definitely turned it on for us, which is brilliant. Broad Beach is beautiful. Uh, I've never really stayed at Broad Beach before. Every time we've come up to Queensland, it's always been Brisbane. Let me guess, surfers or surfers something. Surfers yeah, paradise. Yeah. You know, walking through <laughs> the streets of surface last night, um, just a very different vibe from what I remember as mm. a young man. And I, I have to be very open when I say this. It almost feels like surface has been overrun by Broad Beach. Um, beautiful, beautiful restaurants in Broad Beach, beautiful beaches, lovely people. And surface has just lost that charm, it, it, that twinkle mm. that it used to have. Um, but nevertheless, it seems like a lot of um, the Gold Coast now is moving further south of surface. And just the amount of cranes in the sky, you wouldn't, mm. you wouldn't think that we have high interest rates and, um, or, or potentially a, a falling market with the substantial amount of building that's going on. So it's exciting. Yeah. That's true. And, mate, I just keep heading further south, mate. It gets better and better. So... Yeah. Uh, Although Shrams and I might be a little bit biased on the uh, <laughs> southern end of the Gold Coast. Yeah, but, no, um, it, it's interesting, eh? Like yeah. the, the the shift. There was a post I seen the Courier Mail done. Um, six out of the top ten most searched um, suburbs in Queensland were the Gold Coast. Yep. And um, five of those were 
south of, south of where you were saying. So yeah. it's, it's interesting, hey? Like even it for is. me, I'm, I was from Brisbane growing up. It was always, I only knew of Surfers Paradise. Yep. So Surfers is great. And don't get me wrong, there's some pockets that the market's doing really well and they're behind Surfers is doing well. Some of the new units going in, but um, you're right. It's like a lot of the people who are moving here to live um, are, are more going to those places that offer the suburban and the, mm. you know, the cultural, the cafes, restaurants. So it's, it's guys like this coming up here. It we is. need to cater for them. They've got a different <laughs> taste down there. Right? They do. The, <laughs> coffee, the coffee's definitely definitely yeah. better here than it is in Sydney. Yeah, so well, that's I, good. I will, I will say that. We've got a good coffee culture, haven't we? So, um, mate, tell us a bit about yourself. Obviously, we, we know where you sit now, and, and we're going to dive deep into that um, as we roll on today. But we're always – we love a backstory, SRAMs, don't we? And 100%. We tend to find a lot of the really good operators have got pretty sort of humble beginnings and, mate, really keen to find out about yourself. Yeah, so uh, definitely humble beginnings from my end, uh, you know, Working class family, father was an accountant, mother was a school teacher. Um, you know, for us growing up as kids, it definitely, uh, we didn't have the finer things in life, but we didn't go without. Uh, my father was always very conscious on investment and saving, being an accountant, uh, and had been so for 45 years before heading into his transition to retirement that he currently is. So, you know, definitely a big mentor in my life. Um, I, you know, was a, a, a student at school that did relatively well. I studied my, my backside off. It uh, wasn't that typical story where I got expelled or was a rat bag at, at school, dropped out in year nine. Um, for me, I just very much had a normal life growing up, um, nothing too spectacular. But it, it all started around the dinner table. Um, so I encourage any new parents that are out there that, you know, talk about things with your children because at the mm. age of 10, 11, 12, I was reading the newspaper with my father. Yeah. I was learning about shares. Mm. He helped me buy my first Billabong shares when they floated on the ASX. Wow. Wow. Um, so for us, talking about money was very common. Uh, my father never you know, held back. He disclosed what he used to save and how he saved. Um, and it, it really prepped me for life because these are things you don't learn at school. No. 100%. Right? So you know, he definitely filled that cavity where school gave me the education and, and the thought process to excel and my father gave me those life skills, um, you know, blend them together and you definitely have no excuses for success. Uh, so that was me growing up. Um, I started work at an early age like most people did, you know, the age of 14, saved my money um, and by the time I was 18, 19, I bought my first property. Wow. Uh, fast right. forward on, I'm in my mid-30s, uh, top line I had about 31 properties. Wow. Um, I have sold, I did sell a number in Queensland guys, I do apologise, <laughs> uh, but the market was just too good to say too no good, to. Yeah. Um, and currently at the moment I've got 23 investments. Oh, uh, wow. You know, I, I was one of those people over the last you know, 12 to 18 months that you know, we're all talking about interest rates going up, the property market's going gangbusters, but everyone I spoke to was doing nothing about it. Mm. So you know, if I thought interest rates were going to go up, as we all knew, we you know, were all talking about that it was, and prices are going gangbusters, everyone's saying this is not sustainable, it's not going to last forever. Um, so I acted upon those words. I said, well... You know, I've got pro property prices that went up nearly double in the space of two years. My gross yields when I bought were at 6 7%. When I sold were at 2 3%. Yeah. Um, and I cashed out. I put my money where my mouth is. And, you know, I, I reduced a lot of my debt. Yeah. Um, I paid off my home. My home's now fully paid off. That's I've good. significantly paid down a lot of the other mortgages as well. My passive income is in the six figures per year. Mm. And uh, I'm gearing up. You know, this is what all property investors talk about, and you'll hear that Warren Buffett saying, get in yeah, when, when others are getting fearful, out, get yeah. out when others are getting in, be yeah, fearful when yeah. others are greedy and vice yep. versa. But no one does anything about no, it. No, love you it. Know, they, they say it and they, yeah. know, they know the motto and they know how to, to use the catchy phrase, but they actually never act upon their words. So true. Um, so for me, I, I, I have acted upon my words. I sold, I cashed out, paid a lot of tax, and, and uh, I'll be using that money moving into this market that we're currently in where... You know, we may not see prices come down as much as we think, but what we potentially will see is lack of competition. We may not have 40, 50 people turning up to an open home or bidding at an auction. And this is really the environment that people want to be investing in. Mm. Um, you know, it's encouraging to hear, um, you know, you spoke to a couple of agents and they are starting to get more people through. And I think the initial shock of interest yeah. rates going up by 3.7% in just one calendar year, I think that initial shock's over and... And I'm not a, an economist who can predict what the RBA will do in, but you know, we, we probably all do assume there's a couple more rate rises to come, um, but it will kind of level out. Yeah. Um, you know, but we need to make sure that we're always still doing our calculations and understanding our buffers in place. And 
you know, these are the little bits in time on that graph that you say, I wish yeah. I bought. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you've got to put those words into action. And this is a year which I think many people mm. should be able to really build their portfolio ready for that long-term growth to come. That's yeah. awesome. And that's what I wanted to say, Cross. And why I was so keen to get Jeremy on, you hear it from the horse's mouth, right? It's We always talk about those quotes, be fearful when others are greedy, be greedy when others are fearful. And you hear it here from... You know, whether they say if you've owned six investments or more, you're in the top zero zero point something percent. Jeremy's scout is up to thirty yeah. at some point and he's saying that he cashed out when everyone was buying and he's ready to gear up when everyone's mm. fearful. So you hear it from the horses now. I'm just trying to say awesome. we talk about it, but we've got someone on here who literally walks it. So hopefully that's sinking in. So mm. and it builds credibility behind the advice you're gonna get today from jeremy so when you so it sounds like the dinner table was it's really i'm glad you mentioned that that's a that's a big one isn't it like your your habits at home and what what sort of you got taught and whatnot you bought your first one early what's um what was the journey from there like where did you lean into accounting were you straight up always going to follow your dad's footsteps or yeah so it was uh no no not always going to fo- i always thought what dad was doing was a little bit boring yeah um <laughs> you know my friends were going into careers as engineers and some had trades so i thought wow i could love to do that be outdoors like every young kid uh, loves to be and did some green keeping um in the summer holidays between school and university and loved it and wanted to be a green keeper because i was like looking at all these guys having a great time finish work at two, go straight to Maruba or Coogee yeah. Beach. And I was like, wow, this is the life. Um, but but very quickly, a couple of those guys there sat me down. They say, you don't want to be a green keeper. If you've got the brains and, and the nows to get through uni and, and be something else, do it. Um, you know, this is what we the hand will dealt and we're going to make a good go out of it. So they're always very positive, um, but very encouraging. So mm. I really you know do thank those gentlemen quite a bit for... Mm for telling me to go down a different path mm. and I'm thankful that I did. But yeah, uh, straight into accounting. Uh, so at the age of 18, bookkeeping and accounting, university full-time, working at a weekend wedding reception centre, which was awesome. Um, so my savings were brilliant. I didn't have mm. time to spend money um, and continued to, to save all the way through post-GFC, which you know a lot of people felt the impact of that, yeah. especially in their supers and potentially in their positions at work. Um, so I really used that time to to buy the property, but prices were quite low. Interest rates were still quite high. Still got my first statement yeah. from ING. Really? Uh, almost 7.7% interest. Interesting. Wow. Uh, but prices and loans were quite low and yep. rents were relatively low as well, but nevertheless doable. And uh, it all scaled from there. Um, you know, prices weren't really moving. I had to, first three properties I purchased, I had to use my own cash as a deposit. Again, prices were relatively mm. cheap, so you could do it. Um, but then 2011 hit. And just things started to move. Yeah. And I was able to really educate myself on finance and understand how, you know, obtaining loans and making yourself palatable for the banks. You know, I think a lot of people put emphasis on learning about property and you've got to understand all the cheat sheets about it. But to be actually very successful in property investing, you've got to look at all the successful property investors out there. You know, people like, you know, your Meritons and and even your Trumps of the world. They're successful at putting a deal together. And 90% of that deal comes from the finance. Yep. Mm. So, you know, I really t- I took on the finance part quite aggressively and I said, well, I need to understand how to obtain more funding from the banks. Mm. I need to ad- understand the structure I require to do that, the type of properties I require to do that. What makes me stand out to say to the bank that mm. I'm a person you want to lend you to? You want to keep giving money to. Correct. This is gold. There's, there's so much gold in this. I just want to unpack a little thing you said before, Jeremy, around – by the time you know you had three properties and the market wasn't moving, what most people at the moment are used to that have bought the last few years is they buy property, it just balloons or skyrockets in value. They've got all this equity that they haven't had anything to do for, think they're killing it and they can go and buy another. They haven't seen times that the three of us have seen where you buy and it might do nothing for five or six years. And it's not to say that you've bought in a bad area or it's, a, it's the wrong property, it's just cyclical, right? Like we've all seen the cycles. Mate, take us back to those years where, and your headspace, because you're, you're a younger guy then, three properties, not going up in value. Are you sort of sitting there going, man, this property investing game, I've read a lot about it, it doesn't really seem to be doing it for me at the moment. Or did you never, did you have the long game 
the whole time. No, no, I, I definitely had those questions. <laughs> Don't worry. Mm. Uh, you know, I remember saying, uh, you know, I'm putting this money into these properties. They're a little bit negative geared at that yep. time. Mm. And I was like, oh, t- and tax was high. You know, yeah. you, you went yep. 35 grand today, your tax is only a couple K. Mm. Yep. You went 35 grand back then, your tax was about six, seven K. Yeah, okay. um, so, so your disposable income was, was low. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, disposable okay. income was low. Tax rates really started to become a lot better post GFC. Yep. And, and typically after 2014, 15, mm you know, more money stayed in your back pocket. Mm. Um, but yeah, and no, I had those feelings, you know, I, I, I should be a millionaire by now. Yeah. Um, but I'm not. I'm, I'm actually seeing my bank account go a little bit lower every week. So it forced me to save harder. But How old were you then, mate, just quickly? Uh, I was 21 years of age. Yeah, okay, wow. just, just let that sink in because all your other mates, 21, have got disposable income that they're all spending at the pub or the yep. club or whatever. You've got properties that are negatively geared. You're paying a heap of tax, small disposable income. They're out partying. You're thinking, man, that looks pretty good out there, party, and I can't really afford it because I've got to pay three mortgages. Mm-hmm. That's I take my hat off to him. I've actually been there, so I actually know <laughs> what it's like. Yeah. Um, so it's it's difficult, yeah, isn't it? And it you, was. You can't do everything. No, no. And uh, look, I, I missed out on a couple of the overseas trips and the Kentucky tours, but I, I, I had a goal, um, and the objective was is that I wanted to put my money to use. Um, you know, a dollar today, if you invest it the right way, will be a dollar ten tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but if you don't invest that dollar with inflation, that dollar whittles away. Yes. And it goes back to a, uh, a story a client told me, and I use this for everyone, it's about the red frogs. And he said, Jeremy, when you were at school, and we'll call it the early 90s, how many red frogs could you buy for a dollar? Yeah. And I said, oh, you know, 20 red frogs for a dollar, five cents each. Correct. He said, go to a petrol station, tell me how many red frogs you can buy today for a dollar. I could only buy two. No way, 50 cents 50 each. 50 cents each for mm. a red frog mm. at a petrol station. So y- it, the red frog hasn't changed. No. The process of making the red frog, I'm sure, hasn't changed either. The sugar hasn't got sweeter. Mm. <laughs> it's it's unfortunately the dollar getting whittled away. Yep. Mm. So you've really got to make sure that your dollar is moving with inflation or the market. Yep. And sometimes it may not, but I can guarantee you that it will move much faster than sitting then under your bed sitting, yes. or potentially in a bank. Mm. Um, so that's what I always kept in the back of my mind. And I was studying this and economics at uni. So yep. I read the words on the page, but I never really understood what they meant in, practi- in practical life. Yep. Um, but yeah, that was it. I bought the fourth by the age of, um, 20, end of, 20, uh, age of nearly end of 21. And things started to move, gents. Mm, yeah. mm. Start, like these properties started like, to move. This yeah. is all right. And I, I saw 50 grand in one year mm. and 200 grand in the next year. And I was like... Okay, I'm, I'm You're bored. starting to feel I'm it I'm starting now, to feel yeah. like, I feel like a bit of a baller now, right? Yeah, yeah. And I felt like a bit of a Notre Dame. I knew these were going to go up. <laughs> oh, I knew it. Yeah, like, yeah. it was, I'm, I'm You're telling king. your friends yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. That's you, right. You know, boys, I've just made 250 yeah, for the year. Yeah, How have yeah. you gone? Yeah. Um, but, you know, it wasn't to gloat. It was It was actually to to pinch myself and say, you know what? You, you, yep. you didn't suffer, but you worked hard for this. And now you're starting to see the cherries. Mm. That's awesome. Um, and again, educated myself on finance. And, and lending was a bit easier back then. Yep. You know, loans were very common. 95% plus LMI, 98% loans. Yeah. Um, you know, I was paying LMI, but I was able to rapidly grow the portfolio. And, you know, I had 10 properties by the time I was 25. Mm. Unbelievable. In, in a market which was just exploding at that time in mm. Sydney and in yep. Brizzy. Yeah, and uh, and in Melbourne as well. So I really expanded myself across those three states, and and the more I got to know people in the industry, the more I spoke to agents, uh, the, you know, the more I educated myself. It w- it became easier. Yeah, you know, and you know, it's it goes to that old saying: it's it's who you know, not what you know. Uh, and because I was living and breathing it, I was chatting with so many agents. I was sending bo- I was sending bottles of bourbon to forty year old agents mm. for Christmas at the age of twenty six. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I knew that was a, a key to unlock the door of a friendship. Awesome. And um, and I was getting great deals, and getting I couldn't deals, say no to yep. this stuff. And mm. and I was holding these properties, and interest rates were coming down during that time as well. So. You know, all of a sudden I had rents going up, interest rates coming down. What was costing me money was now putting money in my back pocket. Back in, yeah. Um, so I just continued to recycle and, and you know, do what, what worked. Mm. And then obviously along that journey as, as my income grew and I moved into a partnership and started running a, a practice with uh, my business partner now. We've been together for 14 years, um, you know, and, and learning from other clients and, and doing and practicing what I preach every day. Income grew and... And so did my knowledge and the type of properties that I purchased yeah. as well. You know, the properties I purchase now, gents, is nowhere near to what I was purchasing mm. before. I was, you know, that 200, 300,000 yeah. mark. 
you know, maybe townhouses or the smaller older homes that needed to be fixed up. And today I look through a lot of the purchases that I'm, I'm making. I'm, you know, building duplexes on the beach. I'm doing four townhouses. I'm doing small packs of units, subdividing properties. So, you know, a key thing that I always try to tell people as well is as your knowledge grows, your income grows, your strategy should pivot. Change as well, yeah. You know, I still have some clients who are still trying to find those two three hundred thousand dollar properties because they bought two three hundred thousand dollar properties twelve years ago. Yeah, it's not going to be that way. No. Go back to my Red Frog story. Yeah. So you've got to really play the hand that you dealt in the market that you're in. Mm. You know, the market could be high. I've seen many people make a lot of money in a high market. I've seen many people make a lot of money in a low market. You've got to buy for the conditions. You've got to buy for your strategy. You've got to buy for your knowledge, your understanding, your wealth mm. as well. You know, I wouldn't see, you know, your Harry Triggerboffs of the world buying uh, just a stock standard mm. house in, in say, the, yep. the suburbs of yeah. Queensland or, yep. or, or, or Sydney. Not his strategy. No, no, not his strategy. He's there to, you know, build 40, mm. 40 towers. 50 level mega towers. Yeah. That's right. Mm. So for me, pivoting was important. Um, and growing with my knowledge and my strategy changed. and Not to say what I was doing was wrong, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, it just changed as I grew as an investor. And uh, you've got you to make, uh, make the cookies with the dough or make lemonade out of lemons. Love it. Mate, we, Love might, we might not need to do another podcast this year. There's yeah. a lot of gold Mate, in yes. this. Absolute, absolute it's gold crazy. in there. And a lot of lessons. I just, just really quickly, Jeremy, I'm just thinking now this is going to add a lot of value to buyers. Like, say property 7 to 10-ish. Mm-hmm. If, and forget what you know, post that, think before, what were your biggest sort of takeaways to get? Because that's a, that's a really, if people knew the finance side and what was achievable, it is achievable, right? What would you say to people to get to, say, from two properties to 10 properties? What was the biggest learning in that phase? Uh, discipline, discipline. Love so, it. you know, if you do spend a lot of money um, and, and, and save very little of it and you're purely relying on capital growth, to fund just only deposits, it will only get you so far for a very small period of time in that, say, seven to 10 year cycle. Because properties don't move in a linear fashion. No. Yeah. You know, in that seven to 10 years, there might be two to three years of stagnation, six to 12 months of decline, and one to two years of growth. So, where you buy in that cycle will determine how fast your growth will come. But you've got to be disciplined throughout that 10 years. You've got to continue to have a saving strategy. Um, and again, coming back to the finance side, what makes the bank say yes? Is spending a truckload of money on Afterpay and, and all these eats. other things, Uber yeah. Eats and credit cards, is that going to give the bank confidence to say yes? The answer is no. So discipline, like anything in life, and, and being a professional athlete that you were, if you miss training for two or three weeks, that would show up in the results in your game. Mm. So if you can create that discipline throughout that period of time, there is no reason why you can't get there. And I've got many clients, and I, I share this story with everybody. I've had a client who's been the mechanic from day one, uh, never been a high-income earner, always been into that low to middle-income earning bracket. And this is a gentleman with 12 properties today, portfolio worth over $8 million, wow. debt on it, 1.6. No wow. way. Debt on, and he's just been consistently yep. saving his money, yep. buying properties over the last 25 years, mm. And with the power of compounding return, this yeah. is a gentleman who in his wildest dreams never would have believed that being a humble mechanic could get to where he is today. Mm. And, you know, it's a, it's a story I share with a lot of clients who think you need half a million dollars to mm. have four or five million dollars worth of property. Just discipline. Mm. And, um, and keeping yourself honest during that process. Love if you it. try to ball too early, yeah. um, you, you miss the hoop many, many times. Love it. Love it. Analogy, it, it, it. It seemed like a really overview takeaway there as well. Jeremy keeps saying around his appetite for the banks to lend him money. Yeah. It's that rich dad poor OPM, yeah. other people's money, Correct. it sounds like is mm. what I hear a lot of the astute investors is, hey, we need the banks, banks mm. gotta pay for this. Would it be right, right. in saying like you're always thinking hundred percent accessing funds from the bank. Biggest stakeholder of anybody's per- portfolio, the bank. Mm. They're the ones taking the risk. Yeah. You know, Love yes, it. they've got some security over the property itself, mm. but if you declare bankruptcy and you can't pay back your debt and there's not enough equity there, bank's the one taking the risk. Mm. So give the banks the solidarity, give the banks the confidence that you can continue to make their payments. Mm. They'll continue to give more money. And I don't care how rich anybody is, if you're Jeff Bezos or you're Bill Gates, you're still using the bank's money. Still yep. using the banks. On their yep. balance sheet, there is still debt there in That's some right. circumstances. So it, it's what makes the world turn. It creates it creates wealth, it creates money into the system. Mm. And 
you know, you it sounds, you know, people talk about matrix and all this other stuff, but you know what? Sometimes you, if you understand the rules, you can make it work to your favour. Mm. Well, that's it's interesting, isn't it? Because you know, big companies in a different industry, of course, but companies like BHP and Rio, like generally speaking, they don't own a lot of their own equipment. They they dry hire it, you know. And and for the layperson, you would say, well, they could afford to buy that a hundred times over. Why don't they just buy it? But again, other people's money. Mm. Their money's better utilised elsewhere, and I just wanted to ask you, mate, because it's a, it can, it could probably feel a little bit counterintuitive for for listeners who aren't that experienced to say, he's a guy that's an accountant who are generally conservative, you know, don't get into too much debt, um, p- paid back debt. But what you're saying is, it really, to tap into the value of compounding growth, you really need to leverage yourself, be prepared to invest safely, use other people's money. Because at the end of the day, if you go and buy your own place to live in for call it a million bucks and you've got a, a 20% deposit, that's an $800,000 mortgage. That's going to take a long time to pay that off, if at all. But if you go and actually use other people's money, invest wisely, have a couple of assets going up when the market kicks like you've seen, you can actually use that to then pay down that non-deductible debt. Absolutely. Yeah. So as I mentioned to you earlier, my house has paid off. Yep. Uh, you know, selling nearly nine or 10 plus properties in the last 12 to 18 months. I used uh, that money after tax to pay down my home. Amazing. Um, and that was always a, a goal. Now, many people will say, oh, you know, you know Jeremy, you've, you've, that capital could have been used for, for further investment. But for me, it was that was what I set out to do. Yes. I've got to tick that off the list. Yep. Yep. I understand that it's not a, a, you know, a great use of capital to pay down non-deductible debt. Mm. There's other money you could have made from that. But it, it's what you know, makes my wife happy. Yeah. It, it, it's helped us during this period of time. Obviously, as interest rates have increased, mm. all my debt now is deductible. Um, and I look at it and set aside the home. It's not something that it's a recurring bill anymore. So, you know, uh, it's getting into debt is important. Getting into debt wisely is even more important. Mm. Uh, I don't have any debt on my cars. My yep. cars are all paid out right. I don't like to fund, again, contrary to what you might hear on the Rich Dad, Poor Dad mm. um, by Mr. Mr. Kiyosaki, but... You know, for us, I don't want to have my money into assets which are declining in value. Mm. Like I want to have my money into assets which have the ability to increase in Appreciate, value, yeah. but also provide a passive income yes. over time. And cars just generally don't, uh, they don't give you that much love as much as a property does. <laughs> <laughs> Lo- love it. Yeah. W- what if someone just goes to you, Jeremy, real quick answer. Hey, Jeremy, is, what's your thoughts on debt? Debt is good. Debt is good. Manageable debt's good. Manageable debt. Manageable debt's Love good. It. Yeah. And the right debt, of course. The right, yeah, right correct. Debt. Yeah, yep. The right debt's important. Love Credit it. cards and afterpay to me is not the mm. right debt. Uh, but debt funded for investment is is great. <sighs> just that little... It's Yeah. Cut that up, listeners, right. and just repeat that out because I, I'm telling you, from the best investors think that yep, way. They, they all do. think that way. And it's been funny, even as a buyer's agent, like I get investors, novice ones, saying they all want... They want the the cash. They want it. They want the quick passive income day one. What's your thoughts doesn't on? Doesn't happen. Yeah. Doesn't happen. There you go. Yeah. Does not happen. It's very funny though. See, you know, people from the US think us Australians are nuts because they only invest in properties which provide passive income. Mm. Actually, yeah. In the US, it's very easy to get passive income from day dot because their interest rates are normally fixed on 30-year loan terms, although interest rates there on a 30-year loan term are quite high. Yep. Mm. But, you know, during the COVID uh, pandemic, yeah, their interest rates on a 30-year basis came down as low as 1.99%. Mm. Their yields there are like, you know, very commonly 8 to 10%. Yeah, well. So you could get positive income in the US from day dot, yeah. away, but they don't get the capital growth. We nah. have. Well, well, Not even anywhere close to mm. it. So I think people need to also understand that Money and return in a property is not just about the cash flow that it may generate. Yep. It's a combination of the capital growth and the cash flow. Mm. That those properties that I sold, they more than doubled in two years. Uh, was the cash flow great? Probably one or two grand a year. But I look at my cash on cash return on those properties. We're talking some 300% cash yes. on cash mm. return. That's what people don't look at. Yeah. And you know where are you getting that 300% per annum cash on cash return? Mm. Um, so... That's when it's called smart money. Yes. You know, yes, you hear never sell, never sell. Yep. There's all growing value and they will. But you've got to look at that capital and you've got to look at the best return for your money. You know, it's done really well for two years. That money could be better utilized now in a better investment yes. 
returning a better yield yes. on a like for like basis. Yep. So that opportunity cost. Correct. Isn't it? Yeah. So sometimes being an investor as you might you might hear the common phrase armchair investor. Yeah. And with the large client group that we've got, we manage sixteen thousand people Australia wide and some expats overseas. I can guarantee you ninety percent of my client base are armchair investors. Yeah, wow. Ninety percent. Incredible. And I can tell the people who aren't the armchair investors mm. because they're the ones that have 10, 12, 15, 20 properties mm. and constantly recycling cash mm. and moving that money around and making sure that it is in the best place at the for the it's right doing time. Doing the most work. Mm. Correct. Love it. So make your money do the heavy lifting. Yeah. Don't just you do it all. Mm. It's good, right. isn't it? And even talking about armchair investors or, or proactive investors, which is the smaller percentage as you allude to, you said something earlier, Jeremy, that really stuck with me and it was around, you know, you bought the agents a bottle of bourbon or whatever. It, like that sort of mindset, that's, I mean, you're a business owner, a very successful one, but that's another really good takeaway for listeners because armchair investors don't do that stuff. But if you want access to good properties, you know, 80% of no matter what business industry trade you're in, it's a relationship game, isn't it? Mm. And I think most people would think about property investing as it's not a relationship game, it's a numbers game, and it's obviously a massive finance game. But another key takeaway today is go and build relationships with some of these agents, 100%. buyers, agents, whatever, because like the phone rings. I mean, I know how many off-market deals Shrams gets mm. because he's built a great network of agents and he's got super relationships with them all. If he doesn't do that, you don't get those deals. Yeah. And well, your it, clients don't make money from them. And it sounds like Jeremy, and that's what it's about. It's about getting access to the the platter of deals. And a good investor has options and yeah. they'll go they'll put their money where as you said, where it where it makes makes sense. I'll tell you what though, buyers agents are my biggest competitors, Matt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you know how many properties I've lost to buyers agents? Yeah. They're, they're getting the the bottles of bourbon don't work anymore. Yeah. They're getting the buyer's agents are getting the pick of the uh, or the cream of the, the crop. So, you know, you're right. Relationships are important. And probably what I've seen more so the last five years is the client relationship with the buyer's agent, the buyer's agent relationship with the with the agent, the real estate agent themselves. That that's synergy. Yeah, like that's fireworks. Yeah, there. yeah. Mm. And when it's done right, it's 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 a really uh, really 100%. awesome result that I mm. see. It's like that team team effort, isn't it? Yeah. Just a just a quick one, Jeremy. I'm really interested to know and I think I'll know the answer, but this I hope this sinks into people, right? On the delayed gratification, like long term, and we've heard, Jeremy, you scaled up the 30 plus properties and you've been in the game of investing for a while. What's made you more money, cash flow or capital growth? Capital growth. But right, consider it. C- consider it. Considerably. Yeah. Capital yeah. growth has made me more money. Uh, but my strategy, as I said, I've pivoted. Mm. I'm at that capital base now where I'm happy. Yeah. You know, I'm going to let compound and return do its thing. Yeah, of course. Right. You've got a property portfolio worth 15, 18, 20 million dollars. 10 years, 15 years, it's going to double to 40. Yes. The debt's going to stay the same. Mm. You know, another 10, 15 years, it's going to double to 80. The debt's going to stay the same. So capital growth is there. I'm happy. Capital value is there. I'm happy. My strategy is now pivoting to cash flow. Love it. Um, so, you know, the properties that I'm buying, the the properties that I'm doing, it, redevelopment, subdivision, building, gra- as little as granny flats. You know, I've got three granny flats on the go at the moment, which gross are going to make me about 90000 per year, net fifty grand a year. Mm-hmm. Um, just finished off a, a duplex build um, in beautiful south coast of Sydney, pretty much on the water. Nice. Uh, renting out the bottom, 680 bucks a week. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, cash flow wise. So that's you're looking for that little injections yeah, of cash flow yeah. yeah so the goal will be is i really want to ramp up that cash flow now um work on the property base that i've got to really extract all the juice out of the orange yeah so if i can put a granny flat on it it's getting a granny flat mm. if i can you know build knock it down and build a duplex or a chip triplex on it it's getting a duplex or a chiplex yeah if i can subdivide and build another house at the back with a granny flat mm. i'm doing it highest and best use so yeah. i'm going to really extract all that orange out of that juice and that's after you've built that really the core base, portfolio. Yeah. Mm. You can then start to say, okay, strategy changes. Yep. Mm. Let's focus on cash flow and let's start really creaming what we, that we've got Love there. It. That's Love right. It. You've got to blend it, don't you? Blend that portfolio so that you've got the mix of capital growth but good cash flow assets that are paying for it. Correct, yeah. Paying it through. And you know, I've got clients who you know who focused on cash flow early and nothing wrong with that. Yep. There's no strategy. It's incorrect. But you know, they were buying regional, very regional properties, cash flow two, three grand a year. 
and they're still at three, four properties because they're really having to save very to hard. Save, yeah. And they just yep. can't save quick it's enough for yep. this boom that we've had yep. for yep. the last eight years. Um, so nothing wrong with that. They're still doing very well. They have seen some capital growth. Um, but, you know, you look at their passive income today from where it was 10 years ago, it's only probably increased by about 10 or 15K, mm. where I've got that capital base and I'm really now juicing the orange and I'll get my you know, gross income up by two, three hundred grand by the end of this calendar year. That net net asset strength, eh? Hey? Just mm. a quick one, Jeremy. I heard your might have been your business part or, or is Munzer all your business? Munzer's yeah, my business part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always it's always stuck with me. I love the term um he pigeon pairs property, you know, yeah. with a, a, a high um capital growth and then balancing portfolio with some cash flow to Correct. maintain that servicing based on um use like that. So it just really sounds like like people in your field who've got that next level acumen are always looking at the the whole pie. Like even with are they in a business? Like how's the disposable income at home? Are they about to have a kid? So it, it's it as um, Jeremy said, it's the best investors seem like they're always checking in on where yeah. they're where they're at. I think for anybody that's listening, the best investor is a person who treats their property like a business. Like a yes. business, yeah. And if your business is you know doing really well here but struggling here. You spend a bit of time to bring that struggling part up to a very successful part. Mm. And that comes back onto that pigeon pairing of properties. You know, you've got some good capital growth assets, but to maintain it, to be in the game flow, long yeah. enough, you need to have that mm. cash flow. Serviceability, yeah. And serviceability. So you've maybe got to try to find a couple of properties which will counteract that loss. You know, during the GFC, land bankers. Now, for anyone out there who doesn't know what a land banker is, it's a person who buys large portions of land or small portions with no income. Yeah. Now, really good in a heated market, mm. really good when you've got lots of capital behind it to develop it. But during the GFC, land bankers everywhere went bust. They just overnight yep. bust. Mm. And, um, you know, because they just didn't have the other side of that business plan established Cash mm. flow, yep. for what happens if this goes wrong. Interesting. So It's yeah. interesting. What about if we we bring it right back, right back for an investor that's listening, that's that's listening today that says – you know what, I'm 22, I'm living with a few friends, got no partner, I've got some money, I want to invest, got a tight income, got enough for a deposit. Is something like income tax withholding variation form, is that something that still happens? Is that something that helps with cash flow still? I haven't, I haven't done those for a number of years, yeah, but very are they still in play? Yeah, they are. Very common You know, when interest rates were during the Banking Royal Commission and early on. Mm -hmm. So early on in my career when interest rates are 7%, 8%, if not high up, yep. PYG variations were everywhere. Yep. And what that did was instead of you getting a really big bulky refund at the end of the financial year, with this variation you submit to the tax office and then the tax office submits to your employer, uh, you were able to get a bit of that tax refund throughout the year yep. as a reduced amount of pay as you go withholding tax. Uh, haven't seen a lot of them in the last two, three years because rates have all been coming down. Yes. Uh, people didn't need it. Yep. Uh, but it, we, in our office, we've spoken about it many times and you know, we're gearing up for many yep. PYG variations that we'll have to do for clients. Mm. We're discussing that with clients because, again, there's no point there meeting baked beans throughout the year you know, waiting to get a twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 refund depending on how much tax they've paid mm. or how much money they've lost on their property. We'll get that that little bit of refund throughout the year and maybe get them 20 out of that 30 yeah. um, throughout the year as a reduced amount of pay-as-you-go withholding. So there are things out there like yes. that to assist people to hold and maintain their portfolio mm. during these little bit of the higher interest and higher expense periods. That's what I was, on the drive here I was thinking about. it. thought, you know what, I haven't thought about a variation form for a number of years, exactly as you said, but I thought, you know what, it's probably coming back now to start thinking about it and, and just thinking about every young person you speak to says – how hard it is to get in and you know it was hard for you and I when we started mm. it was hard for Srams when he started it's always hard it's just a different hard you know but um, if negative gearing is going to be a thing again now given the way rates are going up um, the variations you know that can be the difference between someone getting started and being able to cash flow it or fund it through and giving them a good experience because my point being if you don't do that and you're living on the baked beans and you have a few years of no growth like we spoke about at the top i've seen a lot of people over the years just say you know what 
property investing doesn't work. Yeah, throw the towel I'm in. I'm selling, throw the towel in. And they do it way too early. Yeah. yeah. And they just miss that. So, and I've seen so many people miss it by six and 12 months. I know. Yeah. And it just breaks my heart. It does. And they just never can get back into it after that. And it could be life-changing for them. Absolutely. Mm. But they throw it in just, to, just early, don't they, you know? Hopefully this is really sinking into anyone out there who might be going through that or wants to get into it. It's mm. it, hard work, success doesn't come overnight and you're hearing it right here now, right now I and mean, we're mindful of of time jay it's just flowing us because oh, <laughs> like, i'm 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 le- i love it. every time i chat to jay i'm just learning so much mate i really want to get on to a few questions yeah, that have away. been sent in and um a common one common ones as well just around property and tax yeah from, shoot. from the goat of property and tax <laughs> from the horse's mouth here we go so quickly should Explain when you're buying a name and buy in a trust. Yep. So structuring purchasing. Yeah. Yep. So uh, common mishaps out there is husband and wife will always buy 50-50. Try not to do it. Uh, I know from an emotional point of view, it's something we want to do, have our wife on board, our husband on board. There are land tax implications involved on a state-by-state basis. As accountants, I've seen land tax really come in to be a significant portion of the cost of people's portfolios. So typically speaking, try to buy in one person's name. Both mm. can go on the loan, no issues with it. Yep. Brokers will help you navigate that 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 journey. Um, buying in your own name, obviously able to use the negative gearing benefits or if there's passive income, you pay tax at your marginal rate. Ideally, I like to tell people the first one or two properties, if not potentially three, should be purchased in your own name. name. That's to kind of get a taste of of property investing because we spoke about you know, a very small percentage of people get to three or more properties. So I, in my client base and with my clients, I say, prove it to me. You know, get that one or two, and then we can start to look at structure. Um, different structures like trusts or companies or unit trusts, predominantly discretionary trusts is what we use from a property investment or investment point of view. But each state will also have their different um, state tax legislations yes. as well. So it's, it's very important you understand what you're getting yourself into on a state-by-state basis based on the structure that you're buying in. Trusts, I'm starting to see a lot more people use them. I personally have a number of trusts with a large portion of my portfolio in those various trusts. And the reason why I do that is asset protection. I own my own business. Yep. Things can go wrong. I've seen it, so I'm protected yep. for it. Um, tax minimization. Again, you know, I've got quite a bit of passive income that my property portfolio generates. Uh, and I'm able to really distribute that income out Spread to the beneficiaries. Mm. And I save a substantial amount of tax in doing Smart. it. Um, so not against the law. It's just utilizing the tax legislation that's there. That's what accountants are here to do. Yep. Interpret it and then implement it. And I've done that for myself. But where I'm seeing a rise of trust at the moment is for people protecting their borrowing capacity and continuing to yes. continuing the purchase journey. So I didn't know this when I was in, in establishing trusts and buying my properties in trusts all those years ago, but I'm a substantial benefactor of it today. So my trusts are all positively geared. As long as I uh, establish a new trust, purchase that new property in that new trust, not all, not all banks, again, comes back to the finance piece, yep. knowing your finances, but some banks out there will actually negate the debt of the trust that I've currently got. So if I've got the better part of, say, 8 or $9 million worth of debt in these trusts, mm. and these trusts are all positively geared, self-sufficient, not requiring any further capital from me or the beneficiaries, they're going to negate that debt for the my next debt. purchase. Interesting. So I've just out of pure chance, you know, and educating myself the last couple of years, I've been working towards this subconsciously without even knowing. And my borrowing capacity, again, with my income being where it is, it's never been as good as what it is today. Wow. So I've geared up not only from cash and equity point of view, but borrowing capacity is through the roof. Mm. And I'm really well placed to, to substantially grow this portfolio and my goal would be to purchase anywhere between 10 or 15 in the next 12 to 18 months. Mm. So lots of my clients are getting educated by their broker, which is great. They're capturing the client before even I have to discuss it with them. Um, and they're making sure that now the purchases that they're finding, they're buying it in a trust to get it to in a pos- to be in a position where it's positively geared. Yep. Now they'll tweak that with a b- maybe adding you know granny flat to increase the rental income or they may add a bit more deposit to bring down the debt. So it is cash flow positive, mm. not requiring any further capital. And that's essentially kickstarting them to the second property in the second trust, completely negating the debt in the first one. So if you're out there and you're really struggling at a borrowing capacity level point of view, have a chat with your broker. Don't just get the cookie cutter stuff and the cookie cutter conversations. Really understand what things can I do to increase my borrowing capacity. Yes. And the second question is, 
what things can I do to protect my borrowing capacity? Because yes. we go back to what we first mentioned. The biggest stakeholder in anybody's portfolio is the banks. It's the bank. So let's mm. play within the rules. Let's, let's make the bank happy. Mm. Let's do what they want us to do, do what they need us to do to continue buying. Uh, unreal. And, and off the back of that, Jeremy, quickly, uh, in buying in a trust, what's the difference between buying a name from a land tax point right. of view? So each state, and we'll talk about sunny Queensland, for, yep. for instance, you, the trust here gets a land tax threshold of 350000 by memory. Yep. Land, value. land value. Land value. So if you buy, we'll say, southeast Queensland, um, you know, you pick sunny in that, that area. We'll use an example like Logan Lee, for example. Yep. You know, you might buy the property for five hundred thousand, mm. but the land value of that property might be only two fifty. Yes. Mm. So no land tax. Where New South Wales a bit different. Land tax threshold in New South Wales zero. Yeah. Zero. Day one. So you're, you're paying on. land tax from day one. Mm. So you know, a common scenario is we might try to fill up that land tax threshold in their individual names, which isn't hard. Sydney one property predominantly puts you over the threshold yeah. in most yep. cases, um, and then you start to look at trust from there on. Different states, WA has a land tax threshold similar to that of an individual, by memory about 350 as well. Uh, Victoria, I think they've got a token $25,000 land tax threshold, so peanuts in the yeah. scheme of things. But Victoria, in essence, from an investment point of view, is probably the worst state as far as land tax threshold because they've only got about a 250, 300 grand threshold for individuals. Um, so not as high as Queensland, New South Wales, or, mm. or say, for instance, WA in some circumstances. So those are the things you need to discuss with your clients or the, with your accountant is that the structure you're buying in, is it suitable for the state and suitable for the property? Mm. You know, Again, I've got clients that I argue with and they say, I want to buy it in the trust. Okay, what's the business plan of the property? Yeah. Oh, I want to use it as a holiday house and move into it in five years' time. Well, no, because you're not going to get your capital gain tax exemption when you move into it mm. and potentially nominate as your PPOR. Mm. You know, or they're buying a unit very heavily negatively geared. Uh, buy it in your own name. You know, you really get can't the tax add a, benefits. Yeah, get the yeah. tax benefits. It'll help you hold that property for a longer period of time. Mm. So certain properties are based on the business plan of that property uh, is important. And that's where, you know, people like yourself, Matty, and the buyers agents out there, that X factor is just so important. And having that X factor attached to that property will determine the growth, the income, and the structure it goes in. Just lastly, on the on the trust piece, Jeremy, any, any ideas? If someone's listening and goes, you know what, that's that's kind of me, I probably should buy in a trust. LVRs, if you're buying in a trust, where, where do they sort of land yeah, at the moment? T- look, typically um, anywhere between 80 and 90%. Yep. You know, postcode dependent, of property course. dependent, yep. borrowing capacity dependent. But, you know, you're borrowing inside your own name and you're borrowing in the trust is very much similar. Mm. If you can most likely borrow in your own name, you'll most likely be able to borrow in a trust. Um, maybe a very slight difference, but not enough to, to change the course of your journey. Yeah, perfect. Interesting. Deductions. Mm. This is one everyone, yeah. everyone, everyone, loves, everyone love. loves and everyone's confused about. <laughs> Give us the maybe two or three big ones on people, what people don't realise they can claim on and mm. ones that people don't think they can claim on yeah good one so stamp duty you can't claim a deduction for stamp duty (laughs) yeah just how many clients out there ask me questions about stamp duty and i want to claim it you can't it's capital yes which means that you can claim it when you sell the property um so i suppose we'll hit the big three uh, that you can get so borrowing costs are very important so any costs in relation to the establishment of the loan itself big one is like lenders mortgage insurance that is a cost which you can amortize claim over five years yep Right, uh, so that's a big one there that people often miss. Now, costs associated with maintaining the portfolio, important things like internet, mobile phone. If you've had to purchase, you know, files, tubs, containers, Google Dropboxes, all those other things, specifically for the investment property portfolio maintenance, that's a tax deduction. Mm, you know, so a very common thing that's missed. Yep. Um, and the lar- the largest one actually still to this day that I see people miss is the deposit interest if you've used equity to ah, fund a property. Perfect. Yeah. You know, if you've borrowed money or equity from your own principal place of residence... Use it as a And deposit. use it as a deposit. Yes. Mm-hmm. That means you are borrowing 100 and say 300, 400, yep. 5% for the investment. Yep. It's just 80 came from the bank and the other say 22, 23, 24 came from equity from your home, which may be with another bank. So don't forget how you funded that deposit... Whether it's cash, okay, no interest on your cash savings. But if you've funded it from equity, i.e. a loan or a top-up or a split that you've created, 
the interest on that is tax deductible. So still to this day, I get clients just giving me the loan statement for that property and I've got to ask the question, hey, how did we fund this? Yeah. Did you fund it with savings or you fund it with equity? Oh, I funded it with equity. I've just cap- captured then a four or $5,000 additional deduction for them mm. to claim. Yeah. So love that. big they, ones. They love you. Yeah, That's big, big one. ones. Don't forget, you, you know, how you funded the deposit uh, will determine the interest that you can potentially claim, if any at all. The, the the negatives, unfortunately, guys, travel expenses we can't claim. Yeah, <laughs> spewing us, about that. Us Sydney yeah. side has ruined it. Oh, no. All these people coming up to they were know, so good Queensland, going to see their properties, but shooting <laughs> off to Dreamworld. Yeah, we ruined it. Yeah. So Sydney side has we ruined it for everyone else. But travel costs you can't claim, not unless you're in business of property, which means you know you're developing and yep. all those other things. But for you know the average investor, not a deduction. Uh, stamp duty we mentioned you can't claim as a tax Can you just go into that? Because I think it's important for people to understand if they've got an investment they're thinking of selling, how that goes to the cost base and things like that. Yeah, so cost base uh, is anything to do with the acquisition. So legal fees, maybe other fees incurred um, for the, the property itself. You may have bought a property in disrepair, which means that you had to you know fix some things straight away you may have not fully depreciated it so that gets added to the cost base stamp duty so when we talk about cost base items we're talking about what did it actually really cost you cash wise or from lending to buy to that buy property it. yeah and then we've got the selling costs which will include staging fees and agent fees and sundry costs and there might be other little things in there as well that we can claim that will determine your cgt implication yep the big thing that people miss, and this is one of those things that people miss all the time, is the add back of building right off depreciation. Yes. Yep. So there's two types of depreciation. Pooled plant, which is your internal side of things, your doorknobs, your kitchens, your ovens, and then there's the building right off, the bricks, the mortar, the slab, the roof. Any depreciation on the building right off will be added back. Um, and But you get a 50% discount. Yep. So people often say, oh, well, if we're claiming it and then adding it back, what's the point? Mm. Well, it's because when we claim it, we claim 100% of the deduction and we add it back, we're only paying tax on 50% of what yep. we added back. So there is benefit there. Yep. Um, so that gives you a bit of an indication of cost base. That's good. Um, but the, one of the biggest things, which is still today uh, one of the pet hates is, oh, Jeremy, can I claim my time? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> But my time's valuable. I Why know. can't I claim it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can't claim your time. I can't put a fictitious entry amount in there for your yep. time that you spent on maintaining your property or time that you spent on painting your property or whatever it may be. Call it sweat equity. Call it love for what you do. Um, but your reward's in the money and the growth that you'll get in the long term. Gee, there's some value Just here. Just a few fire emojis. Oh. Just going on. You know what right I'm thinking now. about? You know what I'm thinking about. I'm just thinking about <laughs> Matthew Srama, oh. what the clips are going to be around... Right. The drip feed around the gold from Jeremy. I'm not going to have enough week. space in the G drive. They won't can we, get a, can we get a terabyte? Elijah, Look. help. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that mate. That, honestly, we could chat for another yeah. hour, but we got another. We I got, just, I just uh, wanted to ask you, mate, unreal. around um, because you're only young. Mm. You've got a super successful business, and you know you could you could put the queue in the rack today and and live off the passive income. But what sort of drives you moving forward? You know, what, what are you trying to create with your business, your investing and you know, family moving forward? What's your, what's your legacy piece moving forward? So everything that I do will always lead to something in perpetuity. So that's what I'm trying to create, something that I can leave behind uh, and it creates almost like a dynasty for, you know, the next generation to take over and the next generation to take over. Um, so I'm always looking for how I can leave my stamp on the world. Um, not just from an income point of view, but from a holistic life point of view. I love helping people and, you know, all my friends out there and many clients that I have will, will, you know, say there's often many things that I do and I don't charge or, you know, I like to give my time away. And the more I can do that, the better I am. So from, I, I give a hard time to all these people that say I've reached that financial freedom. I don't need um, income to live anymore. There's a $15,000 coaching fee. Pay me and I can show you how to do it. Mm. I don't want to do that. No. If I've reached that financial liberation and I'm, you know, happy where I am from an income point of view, growth point of view, and I don't need to work anymore, I want to be able to help that person and not expect a $15,000 fee in return. Mm. I want to be able to do that because I love doing that. So I'm not at that level yet. Um, There's still a lot of things I want to tick off business investment wise, uh, but everything's leading to that. I'm going to be one of those people you see, um, you know, on a YouTube channel that's saying, guys, I'm going to help you. I'm going to do it for free mm. and I don't want any money. I'm not going to ask you for any money. 
Um, and that's that to me is like that's real liberation. It's great, mate. not the ones that you see out there and say, mm. "I'm rich, I don't need to work, I'm retired." But hey, join my course, I'll charge you fifteen mm. grand. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I can't stand it. It's Just wants to add, add value, the legacy, uh, and yeah. I and I love it. And as I said right at the start of the conversation, the big reason I wanted to get Jeremy on, he walks the walk, like talks the talk, but he walks it yeah. every day. And in, and the key takeaways I took from it was patience and discipline was one that. You know, mm. patience and discipline, even with the investing side of things. Um, st- strategy, like looking at it as holistically as a whole, your portfolio, like a business. Yep. That was a, that was a big one. Education. Away, away from it. Self-education and relationships. Relationships as well, yeah. yeah. It's just like, it, it. it's all the stuff people already know, but I love getting people like Jeremy mm. who are on, who are, who are out there doing it. Um, did the delayed gratification, you know, I'm sure... Um, you know those sacrifices of Contigi probably could do twelve in a row now. So yeah. I'm sure he's, I'm yeah. sure he's all good. <laughs> yeah. The sacrifice was worth it. So, mate, really appreciate you having on. We'll we'll hit him with a fast five. You reckon? Yep, that sounds good. All right, for, this will be an interesting one. I reckon we'll get. He'll go deep with this one. Yeah, he's well travelled, probably. You're looking, <laughs> yeah. at him. mate. It's it's any any dwelling type uh, in the world. All right. So first one is where would the holiday home be? Broad Beach. Oh, <laughs> he loves the coast. Broad Jeez. Beach. What sort yeah. of dwelling? What a little unit, beachfront or penthouse apartment? Broad Beach. Yeah, yeah. loves loves the Broad Beach. A lot of Sydney siders do, eh? They they do. Do. I'm in love with the place. Yeah. yeah, love with the culture, the vibe, the people, yeah. and the place. Magic, absolute yeah. magic. Love it. It's love pretty it. good. You come down the elevator, and there's there's a fair bit to choose from: cafes, restaurants, yeah. lifestyle. It's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, Absolutely, mate, it's, it's unreal. Um, what about uh, blue chip investment? Where are you putting and it can be anywhere in the world, any dwelling type. What are you um what are you doing with the bit of that surplus? Bit of the bank's money. Where are you putting York, it? New York Central Park. Oof. Yeah. Highest bit of capital growth going on there. Av- highest average uh, highest average value per dwelling. Yeah. Wow. Yep. New York Central Park. Jeez. Um Bucks Party. <laughs> Can't go past Vegas. Yeah. I had my Bucks party in Thailand. Did you? Oh, I yeah. Did. yeah. Yeah, I did many years ago. Had a great, great time. Um, but if I could do it all again, it would definitely be um, uh, yeah, Vegas. Vegas. Yeah, 100%. little penthouse or something. Yeah. Yeah, why yeah. not? If you're in why Vegas, not, live eh? it up. Yeah. yeah. He'd have the Italian food on spread as well. Like, oh. gentlemen. <laughs> That'd be nice. And then what about uh, the family home? Where, where do you think the forever home? It's a hard one, but, mate, right here, right now, where do you think the forever home is? Uh, forever home will be, you know, rolling acres, um, uh, peace and quiet, very little Wi-Fi, um, but, you know, it would be in Sydney in the Southern Highlands. Oh, nice yeah. One. Good spot. Yeah, good spot. Great spot. Hopefully, maybe next to uh, you know Don Bradman's famous Bradman Oval, oh, yeah. somewhere around there. <laughs> yeah. yes. Big cricket fan. Oh, yeah? Yes. Yeah. And also a big mad South supporter as well. Rabbitohs. Rabbitohs. Yeah, that course. should that go well this all, year. All the way through. Of yeah. course he is. And then, mate, lastly, um, mate, what's, uh, what's one key takeaway you think to add value to buyers out there? At any time in the market, it's a good time to buy. It's what you pay for it. And it's the type of asset that you purchase in. Gold, love it. Take action, love it. If that if that wasn't a tax property masterclass, mm. then, mate, uh, that, that was uh, that was unreal, Jeremy. Really appreciate that, and I'm sure. Um, and if there is any questions around uh, tax, because uh, when we usually go live with these, I, I usually get some messages. So do you, Crossy? Yep. Just put them through, and we can put you in touch with um, Jeremy. Where where can people find you, mate? Uh, reach us on our website, khipartners.com.au. All the details are there. Various services that we provide, partners uh, and great staff, uh, great colleagues, I should say. Uh, we love property. We love business, and that's what we do day in, day out. We live it. We breathe it. Um, and I like to think of myself not just as an accountant anymore, but more so as just a, a wealth advisor mm. you know, who yeah. puts all the pieces together and can really give you as much experience as I can, I can to hopefully give you the right answers and, and direct you in the right way. Yeah, yeah. Well, you yeah. can see you, you're living that now, mate. And anyone who's keen to go on a property journey, even if they're on a, a limited income, you know, you gave the example about the mechanic earlier. Uh, anything's possible, but it's only possible if you surround yourself with good people and good people. Uh, yeah. we, we've got one here today. So, mate, thanks for coming in. Appreciate, Appreciate it, gentlemen. It, mate. Thank you. Good on you, mate. Legend.